Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> See, I'm waking you up. All right, so now you got to stand with me because the presence of God is in this room and we're excited about that. So let's get to it. Let's worship God this morning. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. He is my heart, Lord. He is my heart, Lord. Speak what is true, cause I am found.
It's good to see that you're all here now. I close my eyes and open my eyes and like it doubles. So that's cool. I'm going to do it again in a second. But right now, take a second. Just say hi to people around you. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly, my soul undeserving. God, your soul. God, you're so good, and God, you're so good, you're so good to me. Behold the cross, ain't you and hour by hour the dead are raised the sinner saved the work of your power god you're so
And should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me.
Terima kasih. Well, good morning. This is our time of service where we stop and we pause to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. That he died and he rose um, from the dead and what that means for us. And this uh, past week I was asked, hey, can you do communion? I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, well, you got something? I don't No. <laughs> but we will. It'll, we'll, it'll work out. And um, so yesterday morning I uh, filled in for one of our staff and did a supervised visit. And I'm literally in the car going, uh, tomorrow morning's coming, and there's still nothing. <laughs> and I'm just like, literally, I'm driving up to, to Fort Wayne, and I'm just praying, going, okay, God, I need something here. <laughs> I need some help. And um, it was an all-day visit um, with a young dad and a couple of his, a couple of his kids. And um, about 4 o'clock still, there was nothing. <laughs> And um, about 4.05, uh, we were ending, ending the visit, and um, Dad ran in to get the, girl, the kid's stuff and comes out to the car, and I've seen this over and over, but I don't know why. It just it hit me hard yesterday that, you know, he, he gets in the back seat and hugs his kids, kisses them, tells them he loves them, and he'll see them next week. And I'm realizing... He is going into his home by himself. I'm taking the kids and going back to where they live and drop them off. And it just it hit me hard. I guess the I guess I had compassion for him, you know, and, and what he's going through and how fortunate I am that I knew I was gonna get to go home to my family. Now I will say the one thing that I, I, I hit as well that I'm grateful for is that we're beyond the the four or five year old years. You know, we're, we're in the teens. I'll take the teens any day of the week. I realized that yesterday and I'm thankful for that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, as, as we were wrapping the session up, I, I went out and shook his hand and, and he gave me a hug and, and thanked me, you know, for, for the time. And, you know, it hit me about how, you know what, I'm just like that dad. We're just like that dad when it comes to our lives and the, the muck and the sin that we're involved in. And we need someone to show us compassion as well, because we can't do it alone. And that's where God looked down and had compassion on us. And in, in that, that moment, came up with the plan to send his son Jesus to this earth, to, to show us how to live, and then to be that sacrifice that we needed for him to go to the cross and die and then to raise again to life. And, and as I was driving home and the kids were asleep in the back, Romans 5 just kept pounding in my head. And I want to read um, a few verses out of chapter 5, starting at verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good uh, person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been uh, justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been uh, reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. How, how awesome to have a God that loves us show, so much to show compassion on us that he sent his son for us. And this morning, as we, we pause to remember that sacrifice that he made on our behalf, I just ask that you would just spend time with God and just be willing to be open to, to see where is it you need to make an adjustment or a change? Where is he convicting your heart at? And um, go from there. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, thank you for Jesus. I thank you that we have um, the hope 
in him that uh, through the sacrifice that you made for us that one day we will get to live with you forever how how humbling that is and you know what we see and experience here right now it's temporary but living with you is eternal and uh, can't wait for that God, I pray that you would just have your way with our hearts and and show us where we need to uh, do some house cleaning within our own heart and what we need to turn over to you. Um, We give that to you, God. Speak to us now. In your name I pray. Amen. You can stand with us again. Um, This next song we're going to sing just intrigued me, and I wondered, you know, this is an odd song to sing for worship, and so what's the story behind it? And um, so I found this in Numbers chapter 6, starting in verse 22, and it said, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make you, or make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And um, I just think when we worship God, one of the most awesome things we can do is just sing his words back to him and to share that blessing amongst us. Um, that he puts on us and his favor does shine on us because he gave us his son and every day we have contact with God where this had to come from Moses to Aaron and then it was given to the people but we have that we have that presence 
And what an awesome blessing that is for us to share in every day. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen, 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 Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping your rejoicing he is for you 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 ha
Good, you're dismissed. Everybody else, you can have a seat. Good morning. I have some news to report. No one at South has stinky feet. <laughs> not, not one person. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that like a miracle? So if you want to be a part of that crew, um, then I say roll there. How many of you have stinky feet? I mean, just, just be real honest, right? <laughs> I mean, how, who has the worst stinky feet in here, would, would you say? Okay, wow. You, I mean, this crew is uh, maybe too honest, maybe too honest. I expected to have some hesitation. Um, <clears throat> I have to tell you something that happened to me, and it's, it is not a one-time thing. It's actually been multiple times this has happened. And when I think about it, it makes me laugh a lot um, at myself. And the first time it happened, it actually happened over uh, maybe a two or three day period. I was smelling something. <laughs> I, listen, here's the deal. Um, I, I, I want to be completely transparent with you right now. Um, and I'm, it's kind of, I'm being funny a little bit, but I'm actually um, honestly uh, revealed today. Today's a real personal message for me, but it's also, I hope, very personal for you too. And the reason why I hope it's personal for you too is because I think that's the whole reason why we come before God is to get real and to be personal. So back to the feet. <laughs> well, at any rate, I am smelling this uh, awful stench, and it, it is just everywhere I go, I'm like, somebody stinks. And honestly, I'll, I'll, this is what exactly what I thought. I thought, who, and I did the check, you, you know what the check is, right? The one, two, I mean, you know, and, and you do it a lot of different ways. If you're around people, you kind of hide it, but you know, the one, two, you know what I'm talking about, Stu, don't you? The one to sniff. <clears throat> At any rate, I do that several times throughout the couple days, and I'm like, man, who is it? And I'm even in my mind convicting people. It's, it's that person. They stink. I even, I think, ask Kathy or people, D -d -d somebody stinks. What is the deal? And I'm, I'm not above that, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> you probably already guessed that I'm not above this, right? And, but it, the reason why I'm going so deep into the story is because it's really relevant to our dialogue today, but I, I, I'm telling you, the whole two days, three days, I was like, this is driving me nuts. I want to know who it is. I, I'm like thinking, and do you know when it happened, when, I, when it really, like, when I had smelled it the worst, is when we stopped. When we stopped, and we, sometimes we'd gather in a circle and we'd pray. I think this happened on a mission trip, in fact. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks, right? It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I started laughing to myself because it wasn't somebody else. Surprise, it was me. And when, what had happened is I'd, I'd bent down like this over top of my own shoes. And the, the waft from my shoes was coming up and just killing me. And I thought, the whole time, it was me. It was me. I was the one that stunk. The stench was wafting from my shoes. And then I remembered that, now I'm not saying I don't have stinky feet, but typically for me to have stinky feet, there's something that has to happen. Uh, my shoes, uh, these shoes in particular that I was wearing, I actually walked through some wa water, some like swamp water, some bad water, and all I had to do is dry it out, right? Well, every time I started walking around, eventually I'd warm those shoes up and then it'd just start wafting up. And then every time I stopped, 
right? I was stationary, and I couldn't get away from my own stench. And a question's kind of come to my heart this week that I have been wrestling with, and it's this. Why is it that we always assume that the stink that we smell is coming from those around us instead of us? Why is that my natural instinct? Why do I do that? Have you noticed that issue in you? You know, this week has been a an incredible week of confrontation for me. It's been one of those weeks where the truth of my own stench and my own brokenness has been right in my own face. You know the time that I'm talking about when you can't get past it, you can't get past yourself, you can't get past your own guilt and your own dirty hands and your own bloody hands? That was this week for me. And this idea that we all stink is not what has given me comfort. It's not what really challenged me. It was actually my own stink. It was me. It was the fact that I'm guilty. Now, this isn't, I don't believe, it's not a heavy revelation to you, and I hope it's not, because I, I feel like this is the truth of my life that for some reason, I've told you this, God has a plumber preaching to you. And for some reason, we elevate the people on stage, we elevate the people that serve us, and we put them on a pedestal. Well, this week has been a real rough one for me. It's been a real honest look at my own guilt and God has been confronting me, and it's been very personal, and it's been very overwhelming. And in the midst of it all, God has run me through so many things, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And he hasn't stopped and I see no end in sight for that. And I'm grateful. I'm actually grateful for that. Because it's God's reminder that I'm not exempt in my brokenness from his call to stand. I am, in fact, called to stand honest before you and share with you that God is good. See, the truth of my sin convicts me of my need for Jesus and the truth of his love. And I've been thinking about that this whole week. I, I've been thinking about God. There's, I, by the way, every, I, I want to tell you probably on a weekly basis, I have these thoughts. I do. God, there's got to be somebody else. God, isn't there somebody else? Shouldn't there be somebody else that's here? And God's like, no, it's you. you you're the one. Stand up. And I say, but God, I don't know that I want to. In a lot of weeks for me, I get there, right? I get there and I walk away grateful and I'm thinking, man, God, you are so good. You know, I, I've said this a thousand times if I've said it once. That I am living proof that God can use a broken person. I'm living proof that God can use a dummy. If God can use me, then he can use anybody. And everybody goes, ah, ha, ha, yeah, come on now, I get it, okay. But they don't really see the truth and the conviction that I have when I share that, that I am being as laid bare as I can be in that conviction and that truth. And just as confronted as I can be on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, 
I think, God, I can't be confronted anymore. Then he says, let me turn it up a notch. Let me really lay you out. And you'll know that the Jesus that you preach is your greatest need, and the grace that you share is your greatest need. And you'll know that that is the position that you preach out of, not a position of conquering all your weaknesses and conquering all your sin and conquering all the things that you want to. So I'm grateful for this week. And I'm grateful that God, uh, he doesn't allow me sometimes to look at other people and their stench. But he says, you look at yourself. I want you to look at yourself. As I wrestled it with this um, passage that we're going to be in today, and it's in Luke. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. There was an opening line to it. That, that says this man wanted to justify himself. And quite honestly, I this week have thought, that's what I want. I want to justify myself. Even in small subliminal ways, right? I just want to justify myself, right? I don't know why, but this story of David and Bathsheba came to my mind. And particularly not the David and Bathsheba part, but the part where Nathan, the prophet, comes to him. And Nathan says, David, I have a story to tell you. Let me tell you this story. And, and he tells David the story about this one poor little farmer who has one sheep. And David and, and, and this other guy, he said, David, this other guy had multiple sheep, any, any sheep that he wants at his disposal. But instead of taking one of these, he goes over here and he takes this little lamb. And David's anger, his, his indignation, he's just so outraged at this guy and how ridiculous, how could be somebody be so vile? How could they be so horrible? How could they be so? And Nathan said, that is you, David. You're the one. Why is it so easy? Why is it so easy? to see brokenness in others, but so hard to deal with your own. I think it's a hiding place, don't we? Don't we see it as a refuge? It's other people's brokenness is a refuge that we can hide behind, and, and somehow it can justify, right, our own brokenness. I've been reminded this week of the beauty of God's grace, and that that is our only refuge, and that is a place that God wants us to remain. And I've told you this a hundred times, if we ever lose sight of our own rescue, we're in trouble. If we ever lose sight of our own need of rescue, we have no message for those who are in the dark who are wondering if God could love them in their darkness and in their brokenness. If we cannot stand and tell people, but by the grace of God, there go I. Paul said of himself, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. A wretched man am I, worst among the sinners. We've been talking this month. This is the month of love. And so we're talking about this idea of love this entire month, the last week, Zach talked about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? We need to love God with everything that we have. This week, I want to talk to you about loving your neighbor. It's quite a difficult thing. These two commandments are the greatest commandments that God has given mankind. And in fact, Jesus said of them that you can sum up all the other commands that God has given us in these two commands. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. They're all there. And so I want us to continue pressing into being real before God today. And so I want to ask you a question that I've been asking myself. How hard 
Is it to love other people? Do you find it hard to love others? Isn't it a tall task? Isn't it messy at times? Doesn't it go beyond our ability to love others? It should. Maybe the deal is that we're loving only people that are pal palatable to us, right? Aren't there some sins? Aren't there some things that we look down on? Aren't there some things that are just like, I can't, there's no way? Aren't there some people? Aren't, aren't there some stenches that we don't want to get close to? So we pick and choose. We pick and choose so many times. It's what I do. But it's this calling to love your neighbor without any ifs. Love your neighbor if they look like you. Love your neighbor if they act like you. Love your neighbor if they do the things that are godly and right. Love your neighbor if. No, it's just love your neighbor as yourself. Love. It's an incredible theme for the month, don't you think? 1 Corinthians, just write that down. I want you to spend some time in 1 Corinthians this week. It's such a great passage of Scripture. Paul says, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move a mountain, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and I give my body over to hardship and that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It is n love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. What a calling love is. What a calling love is. To, to love your fellow man, incredibly tough. But it is our calling. 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. How are you doing? At loving your smelly neighbors. Do you feel like you're laying your life down for others? Now, listen, it's easy to talk about. It's easy to share about. It's easy. I mean, there's so many texts. We can go through it, and we can go through it, and we can go through it. But in the midst, are you, are you doing it? Are you really doing it? I've been confronted this week with my love. And even this passage. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Verses 25 through 20, or 25 through 37. We're going to be in that passage, and I want to, I'll read it, some of it, and stop, and we'll share. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. But, and I want you to grab onto this but, <laughs> no pun intended. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, 
Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? I think the greatest enemy to loving our neighbor is our flesh's desire to justify itself. Because that kind of love, a love that is poured out for others for the purpose of justifying yourself is really not ever genuine. And it's really not connected to God or to our hearts. This guy that was standing before Jesus, he wasn't there to find truth. He was not there to find truth. He was there to justify himself. Actually, he was there for two reasons. He was there to try to trip Jesus up. But then when that didn't happen, then all of a sudden when he was confronted, you, you know, at first he's like, I'm going to test Jesus. It's going to be a simple test. I'm above Jesus, so I'm just going to test Jesus. But then when Jesus came back to him and he was kind of confronted, he did what everyone of us do when we're confronted, what our flesh begs us to do. We try to justify ourselves, don't we? So there he is trying to justify himself. When we try to justify ourselves apart from grace, all the good we do really is for that purpose. In fact, our actions will be nothing more than religious penance. Do you get that? There's a lot of people that, that are going to stand on the day and they're going to say, but we did all these things in your name. And Jesus is going to say, away from you, evildoer, for I did not know you. See, there's a lot of great things, a lot of good things that are being done in this world, but loving your neighbor is not something that we can do to pay for, to have a penance for our guilt, for our brokenness, for our sin. We cannot justify ourselves apart from grace. And our actions again, will be nothing more than religious penance used for paying God for the wrong that we do. See, a life that attempts to, to, to reach out for justification outside of Jesus really nullifies grace. No one is justified, no one is justified apart from God's grace, no matter how many acts of kindness they do for others. That's why acts of righteousness cannot be driven by sorrow, cannot be driven by guilt, or even the needs of those people we're around. Because that kind of love and giving that kind of love to people driven by those sources will never satisfy your soul. Have you noticed that? Have you ever given away to somebody based on a guilt and then walked away and didn't really seem all that satisfied? To love your neighbor begins with letting God's grace heal you and love you first. If God's grace is not the source of our love for others, then our love will never make a kingdom impact and it'll never be genuine and it'll never satisfy I want to read on, because Jesus is telling quite a story to this guy. Let me back up and just reread 29. But this man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Interesting. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. I want us to recognize that religion can sometimes get in the way of loving the way God wants us to love. Did you catch that? Religion and your flesh really get along. 
And sometimes religion can sometimes get in the way of loving the way God wants us to love. To love your neighbor is not about being perfect and it's never going to be pretty. I think there's a real reason why Jesus puts in his story a priest. I don't think Jesus does it because he wants to confront the priest. I don't think he does it because he wants to kind of throw a little barb in the system of the day. I think he does it because Jesus knows humanity. He knows who we are. And he knows that there's a little priest in all of us. I think he's trying to challenge this guy in his self-righteousness, in this desire to justify himself. See, a priest is someone who would be looked at as a spiritual giant, right? Up on the pedestal, they're always perfect. Aren't we always perfect? Aren't the guys up front always perfect? Sometimes I wonder if we're not afraid to get dirty, loving people. I mean, what if we fail? What happens if we got so close to the world? You know, Jesus spent all his time with sinners and tax collectors, with, with prostitutes, with all these different people. What happens, right? We're not Jesus. What happens if we get dirty in the process? What happens if we fail? What happens if they rub off on us or if we rub off on them? What if our holy, lofty positions are threatened by our own stench? And the stench of being with broken people. What if they see our own brokenness? What if the world, what if in our spending time with them? How many of you have let a, a curse word go around somebody who's reaching out to? <laughs> Some of you? And at first you're like, ah. <sighs> If our spirituality is keeping us from the dirty acts of loving our neighbors, then maybe our spirituality is too holy for God's use. I've been wrestling with an idea of the meaning of holiness, of being holy. Do you think that holy is being perfect? Or do you think holy is being set apart? Which, which, which is it? Isn't it set apart? So do you mean to tell me that God could take a murderer and set him apart for his holy use? Do you mean to tell me that God could take you and he could set you apart, that you could be called holy even though you know what you do every week? Sometimes I wonder if, and I've been challenged with this this week, sometimes I wonder if we don't have a poor definition of holiness, of being holy, because we've only defined it by being perfect in and of ourselves. Not perfected by Jesus' love and his grace and his mercy. But you know, his perfection has said, I'm going to take you out of your smut, and I'm going to set you as an example, and I'm going to pour my grace out on you. So that other people would know that indeed God's grace is real, and his mercy is real, and his love is real. And no one loves like by God. No one. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to get your hands dirty. Just get them dirty. I'm not saying throw dirt on your hands. I'm saying, if this man was really a holy man, wouldn't he know who was touching him? Get your hands dirty this week and know that his grace is enough for the kind of loving that he wants you to do with your neighbors. They stink, and so do you. I want to continue reading. 32, 
Jesus goes on, he says, So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side of the road. When we started harvest, at the beginning of harvest, I remember there was this incredible conviction that we had. I'm trying to think, I'm looking even um, through the crowd and see. There were, how many of you were here at the very beginning of harvest? Will you raise your hand? There's just a handful, and for some reason, we're all on this side. <laughs> but I remember when we started Harvest, there was this conviction that we had that we haven't shared a lot about. Maybe you've heard me say it a few times, but I'm every bit as convicted today as I was then. Maybe even more. And the conviction was this that we're spending too much time at church and not enough time being the church. I started thinking about all the meetings that I used to have. I had this committee meeting and that committee meeting, and I had this group meeting and that group meeting and this Bible study and that Bible study and this, and this church gathering, this board meeting and this elders meeting and this meeting and that meeting. And we, I, was, I was thinking, what would happen if we had a church that in some ways met less and practiced more? of who it's called to be. And my point is that I think Jesus puts this Levite in his story because he was a very busy man. And I think that describes the church. Our busyness is something that we can hide behind. If I can just make myself busy, I don't have to think about my own brokenness. And I think that sometimes God even uses busyness as, a, as an act of mercy for us. I think he's done it for me this week. I've just stayed busy, and, and I haven't stayed busy. God has just brought it to me. But there are those times, and I think Jesus again puts this Levite in here, because here's this guy that was so busy in his life. If you do um, any study in this week, study what a Levite did, the responsibilities a Levite might have. This guy was so busy doing things for God that he wasn't willing to do things with God. Now, you might say that's quite a, a leap there. But the reason I say it is because God would have stopped to love on this broken man, and this guy didn't. This guy actually passed right on by. Time is the greatest possession that we have. I believe that God says, teach us to number our days. And the world will take as much of us, as much of you, as you will let it. In fact, I think a lot of church programs and functions take a lot of time and and some of them are great and grand and some of them not so much i think the best use of our life and time is to love god with everything and to love our neighbor as ourself and anything else really quite honestly is a waste of time. Who are you loving? Do you have a list of people? Is it time to make a list of people? Now, I, I know that, the, that lists don't solve everything, but sometimes lists can bring a conversation between me and God, and I can say, hey, um, you know, Natalie uh, made up a, a, a card it's on the back tables, and maybe you didn't grab it on the way in, but I want you to grab it on the way out. And I want you to spend some time with God this week. And I want you to just say, God, who is my neighbor? Who do you want me to love? And I want you to make a list. It's not going to be an all-inclusive list, but just make a few names, and then start asking God, God, how can I love them? God, help me to stop and not walk by them. I, I'm, I'm praying that this week that, that God continues to convict me and challenge me, and I hope he convicts you and challenges you too. 
with this story that he's telling this guy who wants to justify himself. It's like God saying, I've got your brokenness. Now you focus on obedience. You focus on me. You focus on loving me with everything that you got. You focus on loving your neighbor as yourself. Get your hands dirty. So make that list this week. Put it somewhere where you can see it. Put it in your Bible. Put it wherever you are at. And just keep praying, God, help me to love my neighbor. Help me not to be too religious to get dirty. Help me not to be too busy to be your hands and your feet. So I hope you'll take that challenge on. I want to read verses 33 through 35. Jesus keeps going. Um, it's so powerful what he says next. But a Samaritan, as he traveled came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Isn't that powerful? Here's what I want you to recognize. Here's what I want you to take with you. Mercy is not cheap. Mercy is uncomfortable. Mercy is costly. This Samaritan paid such an incredible price for his neighbor. And I thought about that this week. See, my problem is this. This is my problem. Maybe it's not yours, but I'm just going to tell you what my problem is, and you can maybe tell me what yours is later. But my problem is, is I'm cheap. I'm stingy. I'm lazy at times. I don't want to pay the cost of loving my neighbor, to be honest with you. I don't, want to, I don't want to go the extra mile. I want to read about it. I want to study it in Bible study. I want, to, I want to tell people that they should do it, right? Who is it that stinks in the room? Who is it that smells so bad? Oh, God, it's me. I'm the one. There's such a cost to loving your neighbor. See, I want to do things that don't cost me, that let me smile and, and, and let me not be disturbed. Because you know what's interesting in the world? It's just disturbing. The smut that we have. I've shared this with you before. I want to share it again today. If you knew everything there was about me, you'd all leave. I think you all would leave. But Jesus wouldn't. He wouldn't leave. I don't want to be disturbed. And if loving my neighbor is going to cost me, if it's going to make me suffer and get me dirty and, and, and make me stink and me smell, then I just, I don't know that I want to do it. And what we want to do sometimes is why social justice is so enticing to us is because we can actually do it and walk away. And we have an incredible victory, right? Because somebody's eating a meal that you serve them on their plate and they're walking away and they're fed for the day and you can go home and you don't have to even be in that realm. But move somebody into your house that's hurting, that's broken. Have somebody live with you. Have somebody disturb your life. It's tough. And I think about why don't I do it? I know because mercy's not cheap. It's not free. It's not easy. It doesn't even come natural. 
I, I was reading this. I, I did, I'm going to go a little further, and I'm just going to let you go. But I want to just grab onto this. He came to the where a man was. He saw the man. He took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds. What did those bandages cost? What did, the, what did the oil cost? What did the wine cost? Why was he bringing it? Why was the Samaritan bringing this stuff? Was he bringing it to trade it to somebody? Was, was he bringing it to sell goods? Why was he doing it? And why was he spending it on this person? The guy was naked. I don't know what you... Have you ever seen anybody naked walking down the street? I have in Liberia several times. It's just real disturbing. And I'll tell you what I don't do is I don't go over there and hug them. I don't even go over there. I say, look away, everybody. Let's keep driving. Not this guy. This guy comes over to him. He was half dead. So how bloody was he? How beat down was he? I have seen people that I thought were dead before in some pretty precarious places. And I'll tell you what I do. I freeze. I freeze and I'm just thinking. Everything in me asked me to walk the other way. It's what happens to me. Bandaged his wounds, he poured oil and wine on them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and I started thinking, you mean you had to walk? How far was the inn? The Bible doesn't tell us how far the inn was. How far was it away from him? How long did he have to walk while this other guy is laying across his donkey? And then he takes his own money. And, and it's something that's never hit me before, but it hit me with it this time as I was reading it, that he stayed the night with the guy. Don't you think he had an agenda? Don't you think he had somewhere to go? There were no cell phones at the time. He couldn't go to a pay phone and call his family and say, hey, I'm going to be late. Do you know when you traveled in those days with any kind of wealth, it was very dangerous? So did he put off his children? Did he put off people that, that might think he was harmed, he was hurt in some way? What kind of problem did he put himself in? He stayed overnight and he cared for the man. And then he left money, and then he leaves an open tab. He says, I'll be back this way. Look after him. To love your neighbor is a costly thing, but it's what God asks us to do. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is an undoable calling to the church, to you, to me, that we actually need the Holy Spirit and we need God's help to do. But if we'll do it, we'll introduce so many people to the light, to our Jesus, because they'll see our imperfection, and they'll see that they can be saved too, just like we are. I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward, and we're going to sing an invitation song, but I want to read a little bit more in the text. And then I want you to think about where you're at with God, and I want to invite you to come forward and maybe the invitation is just I need help God I'm broken I need help loving my neighbor and so let me finish this question that Jesus asked he says back to the man who wanted to justify himself that was there to test Jesus he said which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the Roberts. The expert of the law replied, and I, I think that he probably wasn't too bold and brave with his response. It was the one who had mercy on him. It was the one who had mercy on him, Jesus. Go and do likewise. That's how, he, that's how he ends it. Jesus just ends it with this guy. You know, which one had mercy? And the one who had mercy, which one was his neighbor? Love your neighbor, right? It's the one who had mercy. See, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. And see, I think that a lot of times the sacrifices that we bring to God are more about penance. They're not out of love. And what God wants out of us is he wants mercy, and he wants us to give what we have been given Love covers over a multitude of sins. 
when you're loving your neighbor, you're not looking down on them. You're actually loving them and meeting them right where they're at. And you're patient with their failings. You're patient with their suffering. And you're just saying, hey, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to ask anything of you. I'm just here to love you. And this is exactly what Jesus wants out of his church. It's what it wants out of you. He wants you to love your neighbor. Are you willing? If you need help with that, the altar's open. You can just come up and say, God, this is me. This is what I need. I need help. Will you come as we sing?
at a crossroads. Um, I am too. Every day I am. And that crossroads is, will I trust what God says over what I feel? Will I trust what he says over what I experience? Will I trust him for what he says about me even more than what my stench says about me? So I'm going to pray um, for you, and I pray that you have a great day and that you will go be the church this week. Uh, God, thank you for this group of people who have gathered in your presence. God, apart from you, we have nothing and we are nothing. And so I'm so thankful for you, and I'm thankful that you have not left us and I know it's our flesh, and I know it's our failure, and I know it's our brokenness. I know it's this world that has come against us. But you are our Father, and you've given everything for us. And so I know in that there's victory, and it's the only victory that matters. And God, if we have to limp, if we have to drag ourselves, whatever we have to do, I pray that you would just help us to go broken, to our neighbor and just tell them where we have found love and how good your love is. And you're amazing and we love you. Thank you for today. You're so good. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.